Hello everyone, um, thank you for being here. Uh, today we're going to talk about <coughs> um, in-memory data, uh, the systems, in-memory data systems, and um, what I'm going to try to convey to you is two things. First is the whole idea of data at rest and your application accessing that data and then um, um, you know, just when it needs it and then leaving it there is kind of gone and I really think that data is going to be flowing from one system to another being transformed and so on. Okay, so first one is data is flowing and you need to get used to that. And the second one is I'm trying to, I'll try to show you where in an architecture you can make use of those in-memory systems uh, and, you know, benefit from them. And some use case might surprise you. Um, some use cases you might be, you know, very familiar with them. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Emmanuel Bernard. I work at uh, Red Hat, uh, historically in the Infinite, uh, sorry, Hibernate team for uh, pretty much forever. <laughs> uh, so working on the JPA implementation historically and founded uh, Hibernate Search, Hibernate OGM, Hibernate Validator, and so on. And right now I'm kind of looking at all of the data projects we have inside uh, Red Hat and JBoss middleware and make a common vision on what we think, you know, things uh, should be going. And I'm s extremely interested in the feedback for that presentation, like what did you like, what did you not like, um, what you wish you had in that presentation that is missing. So use the My DevOps application to uh, give me feedback on that. Um, of course, the notes is always interesting, but the, the details is, is actually what I'm you know, also super interesting about. So we all know that we're getting, we're getting more and more data and we have to deal with that. And the traditional way to do that at the moment is to say, hey, let's create this big data lake and pour everything into it and we'll see about that later. <coughs> My, I think the way things will go and should go is a bit more subtle and more like my data is flowing from one system to another and is transformed and i sure I'll have to keep track of this, what, we, what is called data lineage, the evolution of that data, and it, it won't really be addressed in that talk. Uh, and the other stuff is, since this data is flowing, I can use many systems to play with it, so let's try and use the best one for, for the job. Um, and here is an example. Uh, it's not the only one, of course, but uh, it's something we call insightful application um, at Red Hat. And it's really about... Um, the interaction between analyze, uh, uh, analytics sorry, and applications. So in a traditional universe, you say, okay, I'm pouring some data to the uh, uh, data scientist is going to do a job and then say, okay, here is my prediction model and talk to the app developer and good luck, right? The model where we want to go at the, at the end of the day is more like, um, let's try and make a continuous improvement loop. Let, let's just make one application that happens to have analytics and not, uh, not be two separate things. And to do that, you first, uh, both at runtime to actually run, uh, once the stuff has been designed, both, both at runtime but also at design time, uh, design time being the data scientist exploring stuff, you need to be able to access the data. So that's already political fighting. There's nothing really I can do <laughs> uh, for you on that, but you will access various data services, a relational database, uh, you know, in-memory system, and you know, no SQL store, whatever. But also streams of events happening, your logs, click streams, uh, maybe you store stuff in Kafka in a you know, application-specific fashion and you want to then extract them. So all of that needs to be accessed and available to the data scientist and then the system when it's flowing. And then the data scientist needs to clean the data and make sense of it. So it needs to explore things and that's where uh, a system like Apache Spark is uh, quite interesting and quite powerful. Um, I'll discuss that a bit later. But also you need some kind of temporary storage of sort to say, okay, I'm computing this stuff, let me store that temporarily because then I will build another stage of my computation on top of that. And once you think you figure out some kind of uh, interesting patterns in, in your data, you need to uh, basically go into prediction mode. Know that I think I understand the past, let's do, let's do and make some predictions. So for example, uh, categorization of users, this guy, uh, is, you know, wants the latest stuff, is ready to pay a lot of money. This guy is uh, very, uh, you know, um, uh, price sensitive and so on. So you categorize people. So again, you, you take the, well, first of all, you build that model. 
And then you take the data you have and you apply the model on the data you have and then you've got the categorization, the prediction on the data. And that information needs to be extremely, needs to be accessible to your actual application, which is the last bit here, the act and do it, uh, in a very fast fashion. The application displaying a web page doesn't have to, I mean, shouldn't have to do a lot of computation to say, okay, give me the most interesting articles for this person versus that person. It should be already pre-calculated and accessed in a, you know, millisecond fashion. And of course, an application doing things and, and getting input from user will generate more data, and that's the feedback loop that we're talking about, okay? Today, there's a lot of manual step going on, and you will see at Red Hat, and it's a bit beyond that, the scope of that presentation, but we're trying to squeeze that into uh, a, a shorter cycle and make that uh, easier for you. So from now on, I'm going to focus on what in-memory systems can do for you. And uh, I'll use InfiniSpan as an example. Well, A, because that's the one I know, and B, I think it's awesome. Uh, I'm totally objective on that. Um, I'll, um, I'll give you a kind of a definition of sorts. So <clears throat> in-memory systems are usually key-value store. A uh, very important point is that they are distributed, so the data, is, well, you've got a virtual memory of many servers spread, and the data is replicated enough so that if you lose some nodes, uh, life still goes on. And it's elastic, meaning I can add more servers if, if I'm getting filled, either by, by computation or by too much memory uh, being used. But of, of course, also going down, like scaling down, because I don't need that anymore. And we'll talk about sh uh, schema a bit later. And the other one, which is represented by the pictogram here, is that it's primary, primarily in memory. So it doesn't have to be 100% in memory. You actually do have overflow on disk or another backend system or whatnot. But a lot of the benefits uh, rely on the fact that the data you need to query and access is in memory, so that the access is at worst one uh, network trip away from, from you. So the next steps in, in, the, in the presentation are going to be, I'm going to describe a little bit the use case you know, a, a system can address. Uh, then I'll dive into the search capabilities, which I, hopefully, if you're not super familiar with in-memory system, will surprise you by what they can do. Um, and then we'll go back into uh, the use case, but from an art architectural point of view and say, okay, if I've got that system, what can I do to you know, accelerate things and how can I use the in-memory system uh, in that? So use cases. <clears throat> so of course, the, the one you probably are aware of is caching. So you've got data, your backend is a bit slow, so you want to temporarily store the data. It could be actually next to the app, like within the same memory. Uh, literally a hash map. Um, you store the data here, and then you've got you know, faster access, and you release the pressure on your backend as well. So that's kind of interesting. Um, it could also be not that the data is slow, but it's kind of hard to compute, and you don't want to have to compute too often. So you keep it in memory as much or as long as you have you know, free memory. That's easy. The one that is a bit less um, known is there is a lot of data. Well. Assuming you have such a system, there is a lot of data you could consider temporary. It's not that the data is not important and having the failover capability is actually a, a useful pattern, but it's the data is either changing quite often or is useful only for a small amount of time. And you want to access it in a fast uh, and efficient fashion. So storing it into a relational database with a you know, pretty complex model, etc., might not be the best fit. So here, I've pictogrammed, uh, you know, an HTTP session uh, or a, a shopping cart. We've got actually one customer using that. I'll mention that in an architectural diagram a bit later. Uh, but you remember the, uh, the uh, analytics approach where you need to take the model, take your data, apply the model on the data, and then the output of the categorization needs to be accessed extremely fast. That's another kind of temporary data. And the data needs to be shared probably across different servers, potentially even different apps, or at least several versions of the, uh, well, several instances of that app. And of course, the final one is uh, the grid. <coughs> so here you actually treat a data grid as your primary store, and you can go quite deeper in the way you do queries. Uh, and because it's everything in, is in memory, 
you've got pretty, uh, a pretty efficient way to, well, at least a fast way to do that. Um, you can literally do distributed computation next to the query and do interesting things, and that leads to the analytics. Uh, but I'll go in, into, uh, into that detail a bit, uh, a bit after. So far, so good? Okay, silent is constant, I guess. <laughs> um, let me dive into search capabilities. So I'll explain, of course, what InfiniSpan does, but uh, a lot of the other products in that category do some of it. Maybe there is something that I've missed that is uh, uh, not there, but generally speaking, uh, you know, pretty much all of them do that. And the first one is kind of the uh, elephant in the room is if you don't have to do a query, don't do it, right? If you know exactly that the kind of operation you want, you want to retrieve that data based on that information, prepare it. That's going to be the fastest, right? And that's going to be the easiest. It costs you at right time, but then it's done. It's very, it's a very common pattern in CQRS where the response side of things is actually ideally pre-computed so that in, it's super easy. So the way it's used here is uh, my key represents the parameters of my query. So give me all the um, interesting, uh, no, give me all the books that I need to push to this person based on the user ID. So that's the, uh, the key, and the value is the list of the books, OK? But of course, you need to know in advance the kind of query you want to do, and it requires a bunch of preparation and more memory and so on. So that's where more advanced, qu advanced queries actually come into play. Um, but a pure key value store is kind of dump. It knows keys that are zeros and ones, and it knows values that are zeros and ones. And you cannot do a lot of interesting queries of that. Um, to understand, to, to do more, you need to understand the schema. You need to understand the, the meaning of it, a bit like in the matrix where the zeros and one become something actually visible. Um, so <coughs> in, in Finispan case, we've got two ways to express, express the schema. Uh, one is the actual Java object, which after all has a type and properties and sub sub objects and whatnot. Uh, but we also have the protobuf approach, which has the big advantage of being um, client independent. So if uh, some of your apps are in Python and other are in you know, .NET and whatnot, um, you have this uh, abstraction. And, once, and since we have schemas, we can do a lot of interesting things, indexing stuff ahead of time, uh, looking into the value inside the value to, to find the information, and so on and so on. So let me dive a bit into some of those options. So I say simple queries. I'm not sure why I say simple, but it's more like uh, <coughs> ad hoc queries that you want to apply on a given ent entry. And think of the entry very much as a document. So key value store nowadays, uh, a lot of them actually have a, when they have a schema, it's really pretty much a document or a nested you know, structure of sort. Um, so I can query on the type and on some of the property and apply restrictions. Here I happen to also show that you can do aggregation of those, on those entities. You cannot do joins between the elements, at least uh, not natively. Um, but, and, and depending on the system, InfiniSpan or others, it's either a query language as in string or um, an actual Fluent API. It doesn't really matter. Uh, what the query here expresses, give me all the uh, give me the average, um, yeah, the size and the the average size and the biggest transaction uh, that have been processed in in my system. Internally, we uh, index stuff when you tell us to index the specific properties, and we will use those index. If you don't have an index or only partially index, we first look at the index and then we do the rest in memory by kind of doing a full scan, which looks horrible from a relational database point of view. But remember, everything is in memory. So of course, we try to favor the, the index. But if it's not there, you can still do ad hoc queries. And SQL, remember, is all about ad hoc queries. I've got a model, but I, 10 years down the road, I can invent a query that I didn't thought about when I was writing that model. Right? That's why SQL is so powerful, and relational database have been um, king for, for so long, and still are, to be honest. Um, what's interesting with InfiniSpan, and I think that's kind of a <coughs> kind of a specificity of of, of that project, is uh, that the indexing system is actually Apache Lucene, which out of the box offers us uh, pretty advanced full text. I mean, 
probably the most advanced open source full text capabilities that you have out there. Um, so all of the, you know, let's Google my data, uh, you, you can really express. Uh, fuzzy approximation, phonetic approximation, restriction of the query by, uh, by your location, uh, finding the most interesting document, the most relevant document first, and so on. Faceting, which is the idea of um, doing a query, but then having on the side kind of a navigation help, saying, hey, here is this query, here, is the result, here are the results in, in, uh, for that query, but within those results, uh, there are uh, those five brands, and uh, people rate those products from one star to five stars, and I don't know, maybe the price, there is like kind of a scale of prices and so on. So faceting is really a way to refine a query, giving hints to the user so he can go and refine the query. Um, what else should I say about that? So, yeah, you can really, you don't have to use those advanced queries, but they can be handy, like, oh, you already have a tool that can do advanced, you know, full text query. My data is already there. Let's make use of that. So that's one of my favorites, continuous queries. Um, there's quite a bunch of systems which really say, hey, um, I need to know the top n elements of uh, you know in that dash to, to build that dashboard, or I need to get the number the, the people that are you know have the right credential, and um, because I need to be fresh, I'm going to query. I'm going to run the query every one minute or every thirty seconds and whatnot, and that looks pretty inefficient. So continuous query is solving that by saying, okay. Let me tell you, let me give you the query I'm interested in. So I'm interested in all of the elements that are actually matching that query. And every time there is a new element or a change of an element that means it's no part of the query or it's no longer part of the query, please notify me so I can update my list on the fly and be reactive instead of proactive and uh, kind of uh, system consuming. So here I've got three continuous query, probably from three different clients that are interested in, uh, interested in a, a user uh, the user type, and some of them have the same predicates, some of them have different predicates. And the cool stuff about this one is that instead of indexing the data, which is, hey, this new data just come in or this new data just got updated, having an index of that one element wouldn't make any, anything useful. So instead of indexing the data, we actually index the queries. So we say, hey, this query uh, is looking for age, so let's, let's index by age. So, so I can do a, a query of queries that says, give me all of the continuous queries that are looking for age, because I know the age has changed from 17 to 19, and maybe a user that wasn't into the matching corpus is no into the cor matching corpus. And that's true of, uh, I guess, the first queries, the first and the second. Okay, and once the system detects that, and actually it also executes one predicate uh, only once. So when predicates are shared between continuous queries, it's, it's not actually executing all of the continuous queries. So it's really quite efficient uh, in that way. And we push the event to the client that was listening to this continuous query. By the way, continuous queries are actually built on top of uh, what we call the cluster listener. So it's essentially an event model that says, hey, new entry coming in, update, delete, topology change, and so on. And you can react to that. You can build a lot of things on top of that. And it's plain Java, so you can write anything. But continuous query is kind of a higher level thing that uh, makes it a bit easier for you to write and use. <coughs> Distributed stream is also built on top of something that I will talk about uh, a bit later. Um, so who uses Java 8? Okay, streams. Okay, you should. That's very interesting because instead of saying, okay, I'm looping over my data and applying those transformation and then filter and then, you know, uh, collation, uh, yeah, colla collation of, the, of the data, what you're saying is, okay, here is what I want, how I want to filter, here is how I want to transform the data, here is how I want to collect in the in the end, and please system do it for me on the data. And uh, Java can do it in sequentially or in parallel. It can optimize a lot of things and do it lazily and so on. <coughs> so that looks interesting because instead of doing that on a map in memory, how about a distributed map, which is essentially what InfiniSpan and in-memory distributed system are? Well, you can actually do that with InfiniSpan. So we really embrace the stream API 
and you literally use the Stream API and pass the lambdas to express the kind of operations you want to apply on your, on your data. Um, and it's smart about it. So it tries to push down the operation next to the data and do as much of the operation, including, uh, you know, I don't know, um, if, if it's an average operation happening, we try to do the average locally, then we bring back the information and finish the, the aggregation at the, at the node that requested the query, right? Of course, some stuff cannot be done. There, is, there are specific operations that require us to go back to the motherboard to do the final collation, but um, it's, uh, we try to be as, you know, as uh, local to the data as possible. So how does that look like from a code point of view? Well, it's just like Java Stream. So um, um, in Finispan and actually any kind of uh, uh, Jcash compliance uh, product uh, exposes the cache API, which is a subclass of map. So you just say cache.values and you got the stream API and from there the fun begins. So here I'm saying, okay, I'm going to filter by transactions that have been processed only and then I'm going to do the an average of the price of the transaction, and I'm going to return that. So I cheated a little bit because lambdas are not serializable. They actually are, but they are not marked as serializable because, uh, well, I guess the GDK team has good reasons for that. Um, that means that I need to do either some kind of uh, downcasting for those operations, or I need to uh, use some of the helper class that InfiniSpan is offering you. So the code is a little bit more verbose, but essentially that's what the code is doing. And distributed stream is actually built on top of something called uh, the distributed execution framework, which is a generic way to say, please go and execute this stuff on all the nodes of my grid or some of the nodes of, of my grid. So you can do anything, any random task that you can write uh, in, in Java or, or some other language. Um, of course, you can access the local data of each node and do some computation locally. That's where it really shines. And then you've got lots of flexibilities as far as, you know, uh, what's the timeout? What's my retry and failover strategy? Um, should I try and say I'm going to execute this task only on a, a given rack and to not try and do network, uh, too much network uh, uh, navigations. Um, by the way, Infinispan and um, some other products have this, which is um, kind of stamping the nodes by rack name, machine name, and sites, and they try to put the data so that the data is properly distributed. So if you lose one machine, an, an entire machine having several nodes of InfiniSpan, that's okay because the data has been put on another machine or even a different rack. So you can customize that. It's quite interesting. Um, okay. So Apache Spark is... Um, so who knows about Apache Spark? Okay. So it's, it's part of the whole Hadoop ecosystem. And it really brings... Um, kind of a mini revolution into this one because <coughs> they try to do stuff in memory and as lazily as possible. And instead of exposing the god awful MapReduce uh, model, they have a much nicer and higher level API. Um, and in practice, it's, it's worked. So it's kind of a distributed framework. So they, they don't have the data side of things that, that a data grid has, but it's essentially a, an efficient distributed framework that do computations uh, um, lazily. And a lot of systems share those kind of uh, approaches. Um, so you can access, you can get the data from a relational database, of course, the whole uh, you know, Hadoop ecosystem, HDFS and whatnot. But a lot of other stores are actually started to integrate with Spark. So InfiniSpan is, is one, but there is a lot, you know, a lot more, um, Cassandra and whatnot. And the real key value of Spark, besides being a fast, is that there is a massive ecosystem on top of both an API and SPI. So SPI is how do I get the data to Spark so it can do computation, and that's the various sources that I was describing. And the higher level API is really, let me build higher level things on top of this distributed framework API. So machine, um, you know, the, the machine learning libraries and so on that are built on top of Spark makes it a super useful ecosystem. So, for example, because InfiniSpan is the 
a, a Spark source, a compliant or expose its, uh, its data to Spark, you can actually do some machine learning computation on top of in InfiniSpan's um, data. Um, let me explain uh, some of the cool things we've done when we worked into integrating properly Spark and InfiniSpan. So for people not familiar with Spark, there are three uh, concepts. The first one is the Spark master, which is really the resource manager that says, okay, I'm going to, I know this worker is kind of busy, so I'm going to push the task to this worker and that worker, right? Then you've got the workers that are actually doing the, the task. And then you've got the, and I think I'm not quite sure, but I think either the master or the driver are the one that says, from this big job, let's chunk it into those tasks and then split them into the, the various workers. And the driver is really the application as you think of it, the Spark job as you think of it, because it's got the code and will delegate that work to the workers and then aggregate that back. Um, because Spark has to chunk the work into small bits to be able to do the distribution, uh, wouldn't it be nice to, for InfiniSpan to push that information to Spark saying, hey, I already have my data chunked. I already distribute the data. So in practice, I've got subset of the data uh, replicated into different nodes. And I can say, please split it into those buckets because I already have those buckets. That would be more efficient. So that's what we do. So with the, the client side of InfiniSpan is really... Uh, uh, the, sorry, the, the Spark client that is the InfiniSpan integration is actually saying, hey, I know the topology and the splitting of InfiniSpan, please use that. So Spark is like, okay, cool. And the other stuff we do is we say to that, uh, that bits of code, by the way, um, if you find a Spark worker next to an InfiniSpan node, the same machine, for example, please try and get that worker run on that bucket that this node hosts. So that instead of doing a remote connection and move the data from InfiniSpan to the Spark worker to do things, the, the connection is a, essentially a loopback and you avoid the network connection so it's much faster and um, doesn't kill your bandwidth. Uh, the other stuff we do is because InfiniSpan has a pretty decent search capabilities that I was describing, uh, we can push down some of the filtering and work that Spark would have to do in memory so we don't even move the data to the Spark node if we can. Okay, I think that was pretty comprehensive. Okay, so that's the, well, at least to me, the most interesting part of the talk is I, I gave you the ground, like higher level use cases, what in-memory systems are to my definitions, what kind of queries they can do, and now let's go and dive into the architecture and how you guys could apply those and use those systems uh, into your, the problems you have to solve. solve. So, of course, the first one is uh, plain good old caching. Um, you've got two models. Um, one would be, hey, let's go and embed the distributed in-memory system inside my application. And the memory is, is shared, actually, between my application and the in-memory system. So that's called embedded or library mode, depending on the, the systems. Uh, it's, good, uh, it's good because, well, it's just a library to add, and the, the different nodes actually join together. Um, but because you share the, the, the same memory, uh, it could be a bit harder to tune your JVM because your app kind of object creation workflow might be vastly different than the, um, uh, the data grid um, you know, access and, and garbage, garbaging of the, of the data. So the alternative is to say, okay, no, I'm going to dedicate nodes to the actual data grid and I'm going, use, going to use a client server approach to go and access the data. And from there, I can really tune and scale up and down the value things in, a, in differently. So it's, it's very common in containers these days to really do one stuff for one job. So separating is, is kind of the trend uh, these days. So of course, you can cache at the service layer or cache at the, between the, your slow data access and your, your system, kind of the Hibernate second level cache uh, thing. Any question? Well, this one was easy, I guess. You didn't come for this one. Um, this one is more interesting. So <clears throat> let's go a bit more ballsy and say, no, I'm going to use this in-memory system for my primary store. And I will use that maybe for temporary data, maybe for not so temporary data. Um, and there is a lot of in interesting things that you can do. Uh, first of all, into this. Uh, Container and stateless apps, uh, it's, it's nice to have stateless applications, but 
state is kind of a fact of life. So where do you put the state? So you can put the state into your relational database, but maybe there is a lot of temporary state that you want to share between your stateless nodes. And a data grid is actually very interesting for that, to be able to say, hey, let's pretend this is a hash map. It actually happens to be a remote hash map, but that's OK. I'm just pushing everything outside. Um, who tries or does microservices? OK, some of you. So I don't know about you, but so microservices is can bring quite a bunch of challenges on the app side of things, but it's even worse on the data side of things because in a perfect universe, one microservice should be totally independent from another microservice uh, in its way to run, including how to access the data and use the data. So what about my legacy database that had all of the data and those various microservices that actually need to use the same data? It's not. It's not the different data. It, maybe it's transformed a bit. It's not exposed the same, but it, it shares the same data. So how do you do that? Well, that's a pretty hard problem, and it's beyond the scope of uh, that presentation. So we, that's something we're going to try to work on, especially uh, us at Red Hat. Um, and I'll mention something that can help you in, a, in one of the next slides. But each microservices in a pure universe has to have its local data that it plays with and is not sharing with the rest, right? Uh, you could use an in-memory system for that, especially if you know that you can re rebuild that data from another data, potentially. Um, exchanging data between apps is an interesting one. So here you've got app one and app two. So maybe they want to share exactly the same data. So when app one updates something, app two can you know, read it and access it and maybe have a continuous query on it or whatnot. <coughs> But you can al even also say, you know, app two or this other part, which is a you know microservice number two, has a slightly different view of things. It doesn't need all of those entries, but just this column and that column. So you could you could say, when I store data into the grid, I've got a listener that listens to that and say, oh, data coming in or a change coming in, let me transform that data into something else and put that into a different cache shared into the same grid. And app two is actually accessing that cache. So that's a way to do, uh, kind of a poor way to do, uh, not an ETL, but transforming data from one to, to another. Of course, there is the search capabilities we've described, full text search or, or, or not. And even if you don't go all the way down to Spark, you can do distributed executions and really do some very interesting things on the on your full data set um, um, in a distributed fashion and in a pretty fast fashion. This one is also, I mean, semi-heretic, but mixing store is, might not be that bad. So maybe some of the data you want either a fast access or it's really temporary data, but the rest of my application needs to store things in a different fashion or in a more classical fashion. Well, don't worry, you can mix stuff. Here I added a twist to it because I used um, Hibernate OGM, which is accessing data for NoSQL stores. Uh, as well as, as Hibernate ORM. And all of them actually expose the data via JPA. So it's really the same kind of programming model that I use for both. You don't have to do that, of course. Uh, another point while I'm on that subject of, oh, by the way, um, I didn't say that, but data grids and InfiniSpan in particular uh, can be transactional if you want to. And it's an XA resource, so you could actually put those two uh, updates uh, from two different stores into one you know, two-phase commit transaction if you want to. Don't have to, of course, but you can. Um, and while I'm on the subject of mixing stores, I just want to plug something, uh, a kind of a general category that is called data virtualization. And the idea is to say I've got lots of different sources of data with their physical, uh, I guess, table and mapping, OK? Um, I want. I want to abstract m my applications from these like, massive uh, differences and all of those different uh, sources. So I create a, a, a logical model that will say, OK, uh, that physical table, I'll expose it as a logical table with slightly different names. And that physical table from this other system, I will actually expose it into the logical you know, uh, schema of as if it was a single database. So they literally virtualize the various sources you have into a, um, as if it was a, phys a physical single data store without copying the data. So that's another one interesting. And 
in our system, uh, well, it, uh, um, we work on a, a project called uh, TEED, which is doing data virtualization, and we have a, a way to say, let's do a materialized view. So let's, the system is, let's say the under, underlying data source is pretty slow, so let's load the data into the data grid. Uh, maybe because I've done some join and some transformation, and store that and physically represent that in the in the data grid. And instead of accessing the underlying system, I actually access the data grid to do uh, to do my query or to retrieve my operation, and I return that fast to the user. So it it's faster, and it also lowers the weight of potentially an old legacy data store system. And going back to the microservice, it's also interesting. Um, you know, I was mentioning that. Data partitioning is hard for microservices, like how do I flow the data from one microservice to another and so on, while keeping them independent from one another. So a first step to make life a little bit easier is to use those data virtualization layer and say, okay, in, in the end, that's a big old legacy database, and I'm not changing that right now. I'm starting to microservice stuff, but I'll use the logical mapping to say, no, 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 I'm only accessing this table in that view and only those columns and that other table. So that's a subset of the mapping. So I'm already uh, yeah, removing the correlation of my big data and the risk of trying to grab a bit too much and only focus on that microservice with this contract. And maybe later on, you'll be able to split the data. Okay, that was a pretty long diversion. <laughs> Sorry. Um, analytics and and um, and and Spark. Um, it's a very evolving universe, and people are kind of figuring out the the useful patterns. So let me give you some things that I find interesting. So let's assume I've loaded some data into Spark. I some smart guy has found some kind of predictive model, and I want to apply this predictive model to my actual data to actually uh, to categorize people so then I can sell them stuff you know, in, a, in a better way. So the output of applying the model on the data, it would be nice to put it into the InfiniSpan data grid in this case, so that my application doesn't have to think about all of the smartness and so on. It just go by a key, say, OK, for that user, is there a model? Is it, is it part of a category? Yes, if it's part of that category, I do this. If it's part of that other category, I do that. Right. Uh, so the app is kind of unaware. The contract is really, here is this cache with those entries and that format, and it doesn't care about all the smartness that has been done inside Spark. And I can get the, the Spark jobs running several, you know, every day, every two days, every three days, uh, and update that information, and the app doesn't really, doesn't really care. By the way, Amazon's, they, Amazon, they do update their model like several times a day. And the reason is like, we don't know. People are weird, and they change their, their pattern and so on. So we, we literally retrain our model every several times a day, and we update that model to just stay at the top. So that's, that's kind of this continuous model that we're trying to help you uh, achieve here. So that's the computation out of it. You could store the actual model, so there are some serialization form for uh, you know, a predictive model. Uh, I'm not super familiar with that, so I won't go into the details, but that's usually a small structure you could store in the, in the grid. That's kind of a small use case. Uh, another one, which is a, an elephant in the Spark room, is that Spark is lazy. It tries not to do operation until the last minute. Uh, and when it does, then it pulls the data and do some operation and will cache those temporary operations. But if the cache goes down, it expects to be able to go back to the source and rerun those operations to achieve to, the, to reach the same result. If your source underneath is actually a moving target, like you update the data, you add things, remove things, then the computation that was supposed to return exactly the same result actually might not. So, it could be okay for a predictive model. Maybe it's okay if this guy is predicted to be uh, in this category versus that other category. That's not too bad. But for, for other computation, that might be quite problematic. So a way to walk around that is to say, well, let's go and copy my data into another system that is literally a snapshot and build my Spark computation on top of that snapshot. And you could store the snapshot into in memory. And thanks to the you know, push down and the locality, effort that you know, uh, InfiniSpan in this case has done, you, you know, get stuff faster. Um, 
The other stuff is the Spark job is usually done in several big tasks. So it's really several Spark operations and storing this intermediate data actually makes sense. Uh, not always because if the computation is cheap, uh, you, you don't necessarily want to store it, but if the computation is a bit heavy, you want to store it uh, temporarily. So you could use in memory for that. And of course, if you store your data inside InfiniSpan, either as a copy or as primary store, it is a source of data that you can access uh, Spark with. But it's also a source of events. So in Spark, there is two models. You can say, here is my data. Let's go and run some computation on it. Or here is the uh, stream of change events, and let's do so some computation on it. And the model is the same. So that's quite interesting. So you can do real-time stuff with the same model and same API as the uh, let's do the work on this big data set. When you put something into InfiniSpan, then we can transform it into a D stream, a, a Spark D stream, and then trigger Spark and say, hey, here is a change. Please you know, do whatever computation you're used to do. So you could have real time anal analytics based on the InfiniSpan data that you store, for example. OK, I think I've covered pretty much all I wanted here. Um, so reactive is a fairly overloaded term, um, so I won't, I won't go into that war. But think about this model where I've got an application, I'm storing data into my data grid, and I want this other application to only do things if some of the data ch changes. And that's the continuous query model, or even at the lower level, the cluster listener model. Please wake me up when this data goes from X to Y, or there is a new user into the system because I need to do things, OK? So need to do things might be just, hey, let's push a message to AMQ or an, uh, any other you know, messaging system. Or it could literally be, hey, my app is, is ready. Let's go and run this stuff. Okay? So it helps a little bit into this, uh, I wouldn't say microservicization, but at least simplification of the app, where the plumbering of reacti reacting to something is actually done by the framework, and your app just has to react and do things. Um, and look at dbzium.io. So let me do my, my second parenthesis. It's a, a pre, pre, it's a new project, but it's very cool. Um, it's doing what is called change data capture. And the objective of change data capture is to take data sources, so MySQL, uh, you know, MongoDB, and, and you know, Oracle, whatever. Look at the literally the bin log, the, the transaction log, and transform this data at rest into the list of change that have happened to the system. So you go from this system where you have to query the data to see if something has changed into a system where you got the list of changes into a queue, let's say a Kafka queue, to be able to replay it. And you can react to it. You can add a new microservice that will consume that kind of information and you know, maybe store its own internal model, which is a slight copy of what the legacy system is doing. So I really see it as a way to transform your data at rest into a data at flow and help you go from your legacy system, expose that as events, and then build your new interesting architecture that will explore the data, experiment, do some microservice and whatnot. If it fails, that's OK. You just experiment and get started with that without really affecting too much the rest of your application ecosystem, which is a bit, uh, say, legacy. So have a look at dbzium.io. It's built on top of uh, Kafka, essentially. And uh, our objective is to say, for all of the data the main data sources will create a common model that says, here is a new entry, here is a change between entry A and entry B, here is a deletion, and so on and so on. Here is a schema change, and so on. Um, the final one, um, it relies on the fact that data grids, uh, well, first of all, they, you, know, you can put add nodes and remove nodes from a data grid, but you can ac also have two grids that are actually in sync with each other. That's kind of useful if you do a follow the sun and have a low latency uh, concerns. Um, so one of our customers is doing exactly that. So they're storing their shopping cart and, um, during this you know, sensitive time of year where you don't want to lose customers, um, also called Santa Claus. Um, and they really literally have two data centers. They have a big iron load balancer in front, and they put half of the people on data center one, half of the people on data center two. 
The shopping cart is actually not stored locally on the app server, but actually deported into the data grid. And the data grid is in active, active replication mode. If one of the data center goes down, the load balancer will detect that and move everybody to the second data center, and we haven't lost any of the data. It's live, it's super fast from an access point of view, and I can keep going. So that's for like big iron people, but even you as even well, let's say even me because you know maybe I don't have two data centers at home. Um, I can use that to say, look, I've got a, a grid that is really OLTP, and I don't really want to mess my and, and mix my analytics and my OLTP into the same grid because I want to keep low, I don't know, low latency and predictability and whatnot. So I'll create another grid, sync it get all the updates on my analytical grid, and then do my computation on this analytical grid, which I can scale up and down depending on my needs. So that's uh, uh, an interesting usage here. So, so that kind of concludes what I really wanted to say. Um, think of data as gremlins after midnight when you pour water on them. Remember, they you know, they pop, they transform, they multiply. So it's fine. Embrace that. Um, so I, don't, I haven't addressed the data lineage kind of problem. Uh, it's kind of an open problem, to be honest. But uh, hopefully, you will see stuff coming uh, into, into that universe. But the other part is, because I'm transforming the data, it, you shouldn't be afraid to store or transform data somewhere else and experiment with it. And, and, and keep going. So <coughs> the continuous you know, insightful analytics is one example, but you could imagine many examples of, of the data being transformed and having to be uh, reused from one system to another. Thank you very much. Uh, experiment, take calculated risk. Maybe copy some of the data, experiment with it from an analytical point of view, see how the that grid is reacting to you with for you, uh, and then you know keep adding stuff uh, slowly, um, because you you can even start with not storing your primary data into the grid, but just copying or copying in the flow and uh, experiment with it. It's kind of safe for you. You're not actually using your data, which you know your I guess CEO might be pissed off otherwise. Um, Okay, let's let's close on that and uh, let's open up for questions. Hopefully, you have you know lots of them, and uh, let's do ideally even an open discussion. Any question? Okay, so I guess I'll have to ask you questions. Um, do you guys use any kind of in-memory system right now in your? In your environment? Yes, no? Yeah, what kind? Which one? Okay. So did you th thought about all of those use cases when you have it in mind? Not all of them? Okay. So maybe new new usages down the road? Okay. Anyone that wasn't really here that you want to describe or anything? Currently, we, we use it mainly to, uh, just for caching. Okay, so you use it for caching, yeah, which I sort of described. The, the uh, main problem that we have is that uh, we have don't have DevOps. Uh, we have separate ops, and uh, they would have to configure anything with, with, with distributed uh, um, caches. And um, they just don't know this stuff. And okay. And teaching them is difficult. Okay, so the, the remark that this gentleman was saying is that they, they use InfiniSpan for caching, but the main problem they have is they are dev and they are ops and they are not the same world. <laughs> um, so essentially, they, uh, the ops are kind of concerned about you know, adding those di distributed systems and, and putting them in, in place. Um, so that's something we're working, but within the universe of OpenShift. So that, that's our way to solve that problem, to really say, try and bring that DevOps culture, but also because of this kind of abstraction through the platform as a service, we can actually automate a lot of the use cases. So at some point, I was describing that data virtualization can use a data grid to cache stuff. We would have a way to say, oh, you use data virt and you want caching. Let's actually pop up the nodes for you, ideally with some kind of affinity. 
and you or the ops don't have to do it. That's kind of a template it could use to execute on that. So we're not there yet, but that's the kind of uh, directions we, we want to go to. Any questions on you know caching, distributed grid, search, queries, anything? OK, so I guess I'll release you. If you have any question, private question, you can com come down and, uh, and talk to me. Thank you. Oh, and uh, give me feedbacks, please. Like, you know, hey, I expected that, or I liked it, I didn't like it, whatever.